Chad, the last time we recorded a podcast was September 15th. That is about two months ago. Is it because we're slack or is it because we're the best ball coaches that just can't have time for anything else during football season? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's because we're the hardest working coaches there are out there. Um, yeah, a lot's happened in two months. Like I literally don't even remember like what was happening in September. Like that was like the beginning of like college and the NFL season. Like that was NFL week two. That was a long time ago. Been a long time. Long time. Last time we did it, I was 27. I'm 28 years old now. Last time you did it, you hadn't lost to Darlington yet. Dang. Last time you did it, you hadn't lost to Central yet. Mm. But we did. We were up on Darlington 48 nothing at halftime, so 40 nothing. Wow. <laughs> just, well, I'm just saying. Well, you know, with your region being so difficult, I guess that you had to really – uh, suffer a lot this year. I mean, you played so many daggum war daddies out there that you've really survived. So I expect y'all to go straight to the 1A state championship with no resistance at all. Nope, not true at all. Not true at all. <laughs> Is that right? With no resistance at all? Yeah, no. We could very easily lose before then. Don't give me that crap. This is not coach speak, man. Yes, it is. It is it. There are teams. Y'all lost to Darlington. Like, you could lose. And, like, we played – we have to play teams, like, way better than that so we could win. Or we could lose, I mean. Obviously, we we could win. We beat teams way better than that. We beat North Augusta. Yeah, but that's my point. We have beat good teams, but we've also lost to good teams. I mean, it's far from 10-0, man. Oh, man, that that doesn't kind of hurt me. I mean, this – Hey, we haven't podcast in two months. You start throwing – taking shots at North Myrtle Beach. I'm going to dang – well, I'm Taylor Lamar and uh, let you meet my ten best friends. Well, maybe um, maybe we can schedule each other next year and have it out on the field. I'd love for that to happen, but you probably won't do it. You're the athletic. Well, you, you basically athletic director. You could make it happen. All right, enough of the enough of the junk talk, um, guys. So we're back. We have been gone for a while. Obviously, we are definitely going to keep doing this, though. We, um. Last episode we released with, was with Coach Staggs at Coastal Carolina, who beat for the first time in program history this year Kansas and Les Miles. So uh, it, it's been a good season for them as they've done that and had that major accomplishment. But we want to release this episode today uh, with Willie Corn, and Willie is the co-offensive coordinator at Coastal Carolina. He was a coach. He was a wide receivers coach at Charleston Southern before that, and. Uh, a lot of you probably have heard the name before because he was one of the top recruits in the nation in 2007. And he went to Clemson, uh, he was a Rivals 100 guy, and ended up getting hurt. Long story short, he transferred to North Greenville and played with me. And um, not only is he a great coach, he's a great guy. Uh, we, we talked to him a little bit about how to make practice, how to make coaching enjoyable. So uh, hopefully you'll learn from that. And then we talked a lot about him and his perspective on coaching and playing because he's been through so much with transferring to all the different schools that he was at, going through those ups and downs. So take a listen in. We're excited to welcome Willie Gorn to the podcast. Willie, my friend, I appreciate you coming on the podcast, man. It's good to have you on here. Man, I, I'm excited to be a part of this. I've listened to, I've listened to one episode already, so I, I know you guys are really going to try and build this thing up, but it's kind of weird doing it with you, though. You know, Usually it's like a, some type of – like sports journalists or something like that but a former college teammate this is this will be unique this should go pretty smoothly I, I feel like that's the beauty of it it's gonna be just kind of hanging out and talking not like an interview or anything like that because yeah me, me and Willie guys me and Willie played together at North Greenville for two years I have a lot of uh fun experiences and memories with him and um probably share some of those here on the podcast today but Willie I want to start it off we're going to talk today what we're going to uh, try to get a little bit into is how you make coaching fun. And the reason I know you made coaching fun is just because of your personality. You're a fun dude. You like having a good time. Um, I saw that all the time at North Greenville, joking and playing around and things like that. And um, we just, we enjoyed it. But I wanted to start you off. You, you, were, you were at Clemson. You played at Clemson. You went to Marshall for a little bit. You went to North Greenville. You've coached at Charleston Southern. Now you're at Coastal and you've been around a ton of coaches and Coaches have big personalities, and I'm wondering who is the funniest coach that you've been around in your time, whether 
even at Burns. Maybe when you were playing at Burns, it could be a high school guy, college guy. Who is one of the funniest coaches that you have ever oh, been around? Man. So I don't know if one particular person comes to mind because, like, I, I think about, like, I just think about when I think back on the guys I play for, I think about just for each guy that I play with, there's like a, a set of stories that go with each guy and each yeah. guy is, each personality is different. Each person is different, but they're all like funny in their own unique way. Like some are super serious and that's kind of funny. Some are more on just the comedic side and that's obviously entertaining. So I, I could give you, uh, I could tell you a story from each guy that I played for that would be pretty entertaining. So I guess I'll start with uh, Bobby Bentley, my high school football coach, who is now the uh, running backs coach, excuse me, tight ends coach at the University of South Carolina. And so when I first moved to Duncan, um, you know, I had only played football for one year and it was in Little League and I was bigger than all the other kids. So I played offensive line for like two years. So I, you know, football, wow. I, yes, I didn't like football very much. I was a backup <laughs> offensive lineman wow. getting pushed around all over the place. So I wasn't really fired up about it. But the year before I moved <clears> to Duncan, <throat> I first got a chance to play quarterback and I was just okay. Uh, so Coach Bentley and that my high school program, my strength coach, Mike Schrock, completely changed me as an athlete. But uh, I, I bring up Coach Bentley first because, you know, he would always try to make sure. I think he always wanted us to appreciate how fortunate we were to be able to play the game, first of all. And second of all, how fortunate we were to be a part of Burns High School football at that time, because we had a lot of really good players, a lot of good coaches, won a lot of football games, all that. And that wasn't just commonplace everywhere you went. So I think he always wanted us to appreciate that. So going into my senior year, uh, he would always kind of, our team meetings would always be kind of geared towards that, being appreciative of, of playing the game. And so going into my senior year, we had a, Kirk Herbstreet had set up, and I don't know if they still do it. I think they still do it. But he set up this Ohio versus the United States of America, the top teams in the, in the state of Ohio versus uh, just five, six, seven, however many uh, teams there were uh, from around the country to come and play in this tournament. So anyway, we went to go play Cincinnati Moeller. Moeller's a really, really good program in Cincinnati, very historic, traditional program. And obviously it's going to be a, an amazing experience. So he was giving us a team meeting. He was talking to us this one day after practice. And when he would give those speeches about how you should appreciate playing the game and being a part of this program, sometimes he would get choked up. So he was talking to us. And he's going, he's going, guys, let me tell you something. You don't, you don't understand how, how lucky you are to play football and to play football at Burns High School. And he's kind of like, he keeps wiping his eyes. He says, listen, what kind of opportunities you're going to get to have as a high school football player? You're going to get on a, a jet and you're going to fly from Duncan, South Carolina to Cincinnati, Ohio. And you're going to be able to look out your window and see the Atlantic Ocean on your way to Ohio. <laughs> and he's like tearing up. And as he says it, you know, me and my buddies were kind of sitting there, kind of like, kind of looking around. <laughs> Does he really think that that's how you get to Cincinnati, <laughs> Ohio? Not where the ocean is. <laughs> so, so the next day, and, and every, after the team meeting, everybody was like, did he, did he really think that that's the path? So anyways, the next, the next day I was walking through the assistant coach's <clears throat> locker room. Well, not locker room, but office. And one of the assistant coaches had printed out a map of the United States of America. And he drew a big red X from the Greenville Spartanburg airport <laughs> and drew a red X where Cincinnati, Ohio is, which is like North and a little bit to the West. And then he drew a blue line and it said, Bobby's big adventure at the top of it. And it's a blue line. <laughs> it went from Greenville Spartanburg into the Atlantic ocean and then to <laughs> Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, it, it was just, uh, it, it, I always remember that quote is hilarious. It's, it's funny the things you remember, like you can't, like you don't remember I'm coming up on, I guess, 10 years of being uh, done playing college football, but you don't look back. You don't remember. Um, you don't remember like stories from on the field or during the game, but I remember like quotes like that. And um, so there will be more, but that's, I figured that'd be a good one to start out with Bobby's big adventure North. No. Uh, yeah. Like he must've thought that airplane was going really high up in the sky, man. We ain't getting really on a spaceship. High, really wide. You know, just, uh, also, I have a big issue with Kirk Herb Street thinking that Ohio has the right to play the entire country. I mean, <laughs> I'd say there's a couple of states that might deserve that. Maybe let's go Florida or Texas or California. I mean, really, Ohio? 
I, yeah, I, I, know, now, some, I mean, when we when we lined up to play that game, like just the sheer size difference, I was like, oh my god, this is like a completely different football. Like they're put together completely different from uh, from the teams that we played in South Carolina. But it was like the, uh, Lakeland had a stack team that year from Florida, um, which is home of your great rival, your great rapping rival, Kyle Peck, who's yeah. also from Lakeland, Florida. And yeah. I, I, maybe you don't want to get into hey, that right up, now. Stop, uh, I don't. I really don't want to talk about that. That's hey, still, still a sore subject, man. I really can't believe you betrayed me that night at the team meeting, but whatever, it's all good. I'll forgive you. Um, it is. Let the past be the past. So, there's a lot of guys listening, Willie, that know who you are. There's a lot of guys who probably don't know who you are, and you've you've truly had an unbelievable just like life and the things that you've gone through and the things that you. Um, like what's brought you to here to where you are now. So like just to paint a picture, I mean, you were one of the top high school players in the nation. And I remember because I was like three, four years younger than you in high school, like knowing who you were and having such a respect. And I can even remember going to Clemson to a game. And we had a guy named Cliff Matthews who was getting recruited by Clemson and seeing you down there and you were talking with him. I was like, oh, cool. Willie's talking to Cliff. And um, Cliff was a big time recruit guy too. But you, you went to Clemson. Um, played there under Coach Bowden, and then Coach Sweeney's game, you actually started the first game that he was the head coach, right, against Georgia Correct. Tech? Um, yeah, so uh, Coach, Coach Bowden uh, resigned the week of the Georgia Tech game. Coach Bowden yeah. named me the starter because we struggled that year, and then he resigned the very next day, and then Coach Sweeney got promoted to interim head coach. So, yeah, Coach Sweeney's first interim head coach game, that was my first career start at Clemson in 2000, yeah. 2009. Yeah, so at Clemson, you get the start there. I remember you got hurt in that game. Um, which I know was a really tough thing that you had to persevere through and come um, you know, battle as a college athlete. You went to Marshall, and I know that didn't work out for you the way you wanted it. And then I'm thankful you ended up going to North Greenville. I had a great time, great two years, and I know that from the conversations we've had, you had a great time there too, which, you know, North Greenville, that's a Division two school going from Clemson and Marshall to North Greenville. Um, you know, I, that that's a tough thing. A lot of people would have taken that and felt really negative about it or not, not like that, but I'm curious – how have all of those things shaped the man you are today? And what perspective has that given you? Because there's not a lot of people that could say that they've, they've done what you've done and they've been through what you've been through. How does that make you who you are now? Well, uh, man, uh, that, that has so many different branches to it as far as shaping you because it shaped me in so many different ways. It shaped uh-huh. me from an athletic standpoint. It shaped me from a professional standpoint. It shaped me from the standpoint of, of just my the trajectory of my life. So – um, you said at the beginning you wanted to kind of talk about how do you make coaching fun and is that something that you try to achieve? I think from a professional standpoint, uh, from a football standpoint, I think that's why I always want it. I never want to lose. I love working for Coach Chadwell, for Jamie Chadwell. He's the guy that I, I played for him at North Greenville my last two years, and I worked for him for four years at Charleston Southern, and then we worked together the last two years at Coastal. Now he's the head coach at Coastal. But that's why I love working for him and working alongside of him because he's one guy that – and Jonathan, you know this, he's, he's going to work you hard. He's going to challenge you. He's going to hold you accountable. He's going to do all those things, but he's never going to lose sight of making the game fun and making your experience fun. And there's a lot of things about college football. Like people just turn on the TV and just watch the games on Saturday. And that's like the highlight, but there's a lot of, it's not all gumdrops and lollipops. There's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of things that, that you're being held accountable to. And there's a lot of time management and all those things. And it's a tremendous thing. Uh, but it, it, there is, it's very easy to get caught up in the outcome rather than just the process. The process is difficult, you know, all the time, all the work you put into it. But I think those experiences, some of the letdowns that I had as a player, you know, you talked about the, the injury. Cool. Did we just lose him? Yeah, I lost him. Hold up. I think it, it says, is he Paul? <laughs> hey, are you still there? Cool. Yeah, did, did it just pause? All right, <laughs> that's on me. You'll have to edit that. No, you're I, good. Uh, no, that's uh, fine. I have a time limit on some uh, apps, so I don't, you know, it has like a 30 minute time limit on social media apps. So I guess yeah. they consider Skype a social media app. So my no, bad. you're good. The last yeah, thing yeah. we got, well, the last thing we got was like you said some of the letdowns. So you were saying some of those letdowns. We, so, we're good. We can edit it. Okay, so some of those those letdowns really shaped you uh, from a professional standpoint, and. You know, the, the injuries at Clemson, you know, it, you work so hard. You put so much time in. And I started going to Clemson games when I was in fourth grade. Like, I wanted to wear the orange and run down the hill when I was 10 years old. 
and then you finally get to that point where you get your first career start and then you get injured. So it was a lot of time put into it. And then, a, then you, you kind of hit a valley. Then I transferred to Marshall and, and you, you still want to play at the division one level. And, and um, I got beat out by guys there. So, you know, again, you're trying to achieve that goal and then and it's a letdown. And then when I got to North Greenville at that point, man, I just wanted to compete. I just wanted to play. I didn't care if it was in a parking lot or wherever, but, you know, thankfully there was one school, um, there was one coach that returned My dad sent a couple emails out to some division two coaches that were close by. And I still have the email at my house. My dad printed a hard copy. I still have their exchange. Coach Shawell had had a couple quarterbacks get hurt at North Greenville. So he was, he needed a quarterback. I needed somebody just to let me wear a jersey and let me play. And, um, but because you had some of those letdowns and some of those things that didn't go according to plan, I think that's why now I, I, want, I want the players to enjoy the experience of it. I want them to learn to connect with their teammates and not take that for granted because those two years in North Greenville were just so much. I just had a blast. And, and we were lucky if you got a thousand people in the stands. We were lucky if our jerseys didn't completely disintegrate during a game because they're, you know, it's not the, it's not Nike. You know, we got Adidas our, our last year, but the first year, I, I don't know who the. It was, Let me it was tell you, athletic. It was. Can I, I mean, it was. Can I tell a quick story on you with our jerseys? Yeah, please do. While you do this, okay. So speaking of our jerseys, guys, our first year, we I don't even know if there was a brand. It wasn't even Badger. So our <laughs> white jerseys, our white jerseys were like kind of orange in a weird way. It was like yeah. dirty, nasty, sweat orange. And I remember we were playing UNC Pembroke and we were out there warming up on the field and they were laughing at us and talking junk about, man, y'all's jerseys look stupid, huh? <laughs> and I remember going in the locker room, Willie, and you went in there and you like punched a locker and said, nobody makes fun of our stupid jerseys except for us. <laughs> and I died laughing. And I was like, you know what? Our jerseys really do suck, but it's okay. And we went out there and we beat the crap out of them. And you, I mean, you were fake. You were like joking with it, but it was hilarious. And it kind of let the moment down. But yeah, our, we were lucky if our jerseys didn't disintegrate. But sorry, I know what you, you were saying there. No. You were saying we were lucky no, if was, we had it anything. Was, it, it was meant to be a uh, White Goodman quote, you know. Nobody makes me bleed my own blood. Nobody. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so a- anyways, because uh, – and, and at North Greenville – Division two football. So I don't know what North Greenville is up to scholarship wise now, but it was uh, 18, 19 scholarships, maybe dispersed between a hundred guys. So you had a bunch of guys that were not on scholarship. You had guys that were working during the week, during the season, just to, to make it work, to, to get it done. You know, guys are working during the summer, but guys just, you know, love playing the game and they're passionate about it. And they're passionate about, just being a good teammate and enjoying the time we had together. So that really shaped me. It made me just so thankful for North Greenville and thankful for Coach Shaw to give me an opportunity. But from that point on, because the time, the difficult, the, the times with injuries or the times with, you know, you didn't attain your goals were so disappointing. You hit those lows. It got to the point where before North Greenville, like if you would have told me after I left Marshall that you'd be coaching, I'd say probably not. Cause I just didn't really enjoy the game. I, I'd lost the, the joy for the game and before some of those difficulties man, I, lo- I love football because not not so much I mean I love Friday nights I love playing and everything but I just love the fact that you're around a group of guys most of them are some of them are similar to you but a lot of them are different from you they come from different homes different places and you get to you get to create these lifelong memories and lifelong friendships that you can't duplicate anywhere else and that's what really I wanted to become a coach because I wanted to be, a, be around the competitive side of it, but also be able to create those those last relationships with guys that you can't, it's difficult to create anywhere else because it's such a unique uh, place. But also North Greenville, I, I met my wife at North Greenville. My wife played volleyball. Uh, Charlotte played, um, her name is Charlotte. She played volleyball there. So we met because she went to North Greenville. Um, I played for Coach Chabell. Coach Chabell gave my first coaching opportunity. So it was not a coincidence that I ended up there. Um, but just looking before North Greenville, some of those difficulties, that's why I guess I, I've never lost sight of, hey, in, enjoy the process. You know, even the difficulties, like first year here at Coastal, it, it was a difficult year because we finished up three and nine and went on, had some difficulties that first season. And, um, but, and, 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 and there's nothing fun about going on a losing streak, obviously, but just not taking for granted, going back to what Coach Bentley said, not taking for granted and kind of enjoying every single day, enjoying the opportunity that you get because it is, 
what a tremendous opportunity every day I get to go in, go in and talk in and work at Coastal Carolina or wherever I'm working. That doesn't matter. That's not just because of Coastal Carolina, just being a college football coach. What it's a difficult play, uh, thing to get into, uh, and it requires a lot, but it's a tremendous blessing, and it's uh, I mean, it is a blast getting the opportunity to build these relationships with players and other coaches. Now, you've had a super interesting um, playing career that you just detailed. A lot of crazy highs. I mean, I was thinking about it today. I just remembered you had a NFL Network documentary thing from back <laughs> then. I remember watching when I was in like ninth grade. Like you had a lot of highs, lows, all those things in your playing career. Um, but you've also had now a super successful coaching career. What's more gratifying for you? Um, being a coach or a player for me personally, you know, I enjoyed my playing career. High school was great. Got to play in college was great. But honestly, like when I go out, I would rather go coach this year than play again. Like, and I know that uh, that's different for some people. What's more gratifying for you coaching or playing? Well, I, I watched our players work out in the weight room for a little bit this morning. I don't, I don't know if I want to jump back into that. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. Hey, uh, uh, my, my wife works out at nine rounds, the little kickboxing place. So I'll go with her every once in a while. And I almost pass out from that. So I, I don't think I'd be able to, to be able to pull it off, but no, I I've, I've been asked that question before by just like family members and friends, you know, what's the comparison like, do you like enjoy playing or coaching more, more so when you first get into coaching, I think that's when people ask you the most, but even after my first year of coaching, I love playing. I love being a part of the locker room, but I don't know, like the, the gratification you get from coaching is just a completely different thing, um, a completely different feeling um, because you get an opportunity to try and mold guys. You get an opportunity to try and, you know, steer their life in a certain way. And because you have coach at the front of your name, you get a you get their ear in a, in a different way than maybe somebody else does. And um and to, to, to invest in, I think everybody, probably every guy that's got into coaching, you probably have one or two guys that stand out to you that, that really struggled and really improved over their, the two or three or four years that you had with them. And I can think of, uh, this is going to be year number seven for me. So I'm still very green and um, still gaining experience every single year. But I can think back to some certain guys that, you know, maybe their freshman year, it's like, man, I don't, I don't know if this guy's going to get, it. I don't know if he'll, the light bulb will come on, how much will he improve? And then that guy ends up, playing and make a big play for you and it's so cool to see guys that do it the right way and work their tails off get rewarded on the field or you know guys that uh, there's a guy at Charleston Southern that had the opportunity to coach recruit and coach and he's, he's the first college graduate in his family completely completely changed his family tree and you get to be a, a small piece of that so just it's a different type of gratification but it's it's awesome getting to serve our players and try to live in a way you don't always you fall short of you try to live in a way hopefully that they want to emulate and you build the type of relationships that you know we always said when we worked together at charleston southern with that staff we always wanted to be invited back to their to their weddings one day that was the goal Ho hope we, you build that kind of relationship that you that you get an invite so yeah i i love i love coaching i love it i really do willie you got to do something, too, that's really cool. I don't know if I've ever heard of this. You coached your younger brother at Charleston Southern. Not only were you coaching on the team, he was in your position. So yeah. what was that like for you? Was that kind of weird, or was it – did he – was it easy for you? Did he just kind of, like, mold in with the rest of the guys, or did he ever have that little brother, older brother dynamic? What was that like? It, um, man, it was – I'm so thankful that we got all that, all that time together. We got four years together. Of spending a lot of time together, you know, and even when, um, you know, Colt, my younger brother's name is Colton, and he had committed to Charleston Southern um, basically a month before the job was offered to me. So he was already committed, and I asked him, are you, I wanted to make sure he was okay with this, because I didn't want him to feel like he was uh, getting a special privilege or opportunity at Charleston Southern because I was coming there, because it was, it was his show first, and then I kind of came in and crashed it, and um so, um, you know, I, I never wanted him to feel – I never wanted the other players to perceive him as having, like I said, uh, special privileges because his brother's a coach. So it actually worked out perfect. Um, he doesn't like this story. Uh, but <laughs> our first fall camp together in 2013 at Charleston Southern, uh, there was a conditioning test before the first practice. You had to pass the conditioning test before you could uh, be permitted to practice. And Coach Chow usually likes to go with the um, 
the uh, the shuttles. I, oh gosh, what are they? Five, That's what we did. Five, ten, fifteen yard shuttle. I don't yeah. know what you. Uh, I forget what you call them. I'm Sixty yard shuttle, I think. Sixty yard shuttle. Yeah. And so I can't remember how many they had to do, but anyways, the entire team. You know, it's supposed to start at whatever it was, two o'clock. So the entire team, all ninety four guys, all have the correct shirt on, correct shorts, cleats that were just given out. They're all on the line, ready to go, except for one person. And of course, oh it was it, it was my brother. So he comes trot, trotting out five minutes late, and and I smoked him pretty good. Like you know, I, I usually I'm not a big yeller, um, just because I think you know, obviously. When you're coaching, you're teaching. I, I view it as a as an opportunity to be able to teach and to help guys grow. But there's certain times, obviously, when that voice inflection needs to change a little bit. So that was one of those um, opportunities uh, to to change the voice inflection. So I smoked them pretty good, and so I think from that point on, they're like, okay, th- th- you know, he's not going to be able to get away with stuff. So, um, but uh, so it, it was it was an awesome experience. We had so much so much fun together, and and we're able to be a part of two conference championship teams, and go to the playoffs with Charleston Southern, and played against North Dakota State on ESPN. So it was a lot of cool opportunities, and it was perfect for my dad. So when he'd come when he'd come to go visit his sons, he got to go to one place and see both of us on the same weekend, go to the same game. So we had a blast. And so Colton, when he got done playing, and Colton was just a partial scholarship guy, just on barely any money when he first got there, but he ended up earning a starting job and end up earning a scholarship when he's there. So he's got a great story of uh, persevering and, um, and really kind of earning what he got there in Charleston Southern. Uh, but his first year out of school, 2017 here at Coastal, he was um, a volunteer for us. He was an intern for us with the football team. He was at Citadel last year. Now he's back at Coastal as an analyst. So uh, it, it's pretty cool to go from that player coach relationship. Now we're coaching alongside each other and, and continue to get to create memories together. Yeah, I know with a family member, you know my dad, Willie, and obviously Chad knows my dad. I, do. Um, I know that my dad coached me my senior year, and you got to make that example. Dad didn't mind doing that at all with me. Uh, <laughs> so I was wondering I was wondering if it was the same thing for a brother. Uh, but I guess it is. Yeah, you do really have to set that apart because you never want somebody to think, oh, well, you know, they're the they're the favorite. But at the same time, you don't want to go too far the other way. So, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. He's, he's, he's going to be my brother a heck of a lot longer than he is a uh, player. Yeah. And That's right. you're going to be Coach White's son a heck of a lot longer than a player for it. So you can't ever lose sight of that, too. Yeah. Yeah. So and I was curious about this with your personality. I mean, you just you like to have fun. That's just who you are. The practices, meetings and things like that and think, like, how can I make this more enjoyable? Or do you just be yourself and let things happen as they do? Do you uh, make a choice? Do you have things that you do like um, every week? Is there anything you do to uh, like a, make a discipline or a practice of uh, enjoyment and for the guys? Um, so I think, um, I think coach Chowell does a really, really good job of that. I listened to your podcast with him and you're talking about how, you know, he would set up one-on-one, uh, matchups between coaches before yeah. practice to get practice going. Uh, coach Chowell will do the, uh, offense alignment field, field upon at the end of practice. If he fields it, conditioning's over. If they drop it, you got more conditioning. Coach Chowell's, uh, I remember one of the my I think it was my first year at Charleston Southern. We were, we were playing against a team that was ranked top ten in the country, and it was a really big 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 game for the players. And you you kind of noticed that they were um, they were kind of tight during the week and not practicing like themselves and and not loose. They're very very uptight. And he had an ice cream truck come out to practice on on whatever it was Tuesday or Wednesday just to try and. He's never – he's always done a great job of that. So I think it, it makes it a little bit easier on you as a position coach when you got a head coach that's already kind of taken, taken ownership of that. Um, yeah. He's trying to think of ways to, in which that he can, he can break up the monotony a little bit. Um, as a receiver's coach, your position meeting time is so few and precious, it's kind of hard to have, have a way that you can do it in meetings. But uh, just from an overall standpoint, usually, especially with receivers, I'm coaching quarterbacks for the, for the first time this year so spring was my first time with quarterbacks before that was with receivers so typically we have music going during position meetings um i tell those guys uh, yeah i want it to be interactive so i'm i'm constantly i'm never just asking general questions i'm asked personally hey, hey jonathan tell me what you would see on this hey doug whatever you're asking specific questions so you're you're, you're kind of challenging them but you're 
uh, you're making them kind of actively actively participate. Uh, but little stuff, I don't, I don't know if it's really that great of an idea or anything, but just to try and break up the monotony of camp sometimes, like I'll assign somebody to provide a, a fact of the day before the meeting starts. It doesn't take up too much time. So it's actually kind of funny some of the things that players will bring up. Like, oh, yeah. did you know this about – uh, rattlesnakes and they'll give you some like random <laughs> random fact yeah. and then and it's funny it's like you end up going back home and I would like tell my wife about it I was like hey did you know that <laughs> did you know that rattlesnakes could do this or whatever it is you know so yeah. I've, I've done that before but I, I don't you know it's just I, I think uh, as long as you know your head coach is kind of setting the tempo there and coming up with things in practice I think um, and I'm, I'm fortunate I work for a head coach that that does a good job with that but I think ultimately it comes down to what your personality is like. You know, you can't, you can't try to, because you see this coach on TV and he's really successful. You can't, you can try to emulate certain things about his program or certain things that they like to do um, schematically, but you can't morph your personality into somebody that you're not. You've got to be your personality. And I just try to be myself. And, and again, there's going to be times when you need to get on your players. You need to hold them accountable, challenge them. That's part of the, part of the code but one of the things that we do is a little bit different is we we coach chow gives us time during the day to spend with our players outside of outside of football and he wants those meetings to take place he wants those meetings to he wants you to not talk about football now that was during the spring i don't know if that'll happen during the fall just because you're so, <laughs> you're so crunched for time but during during yeah. the spring we would have uh 30 minutes allotted on certain days where hey you want i want you to go meet with meet with the players and just don't talk about football. See how they're doing. Check in on them. Make sure that they know that this this is bigger than just football. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how is that transition going from receivers to quarterbacks been going? Uh, it, it's uh, I was so excited when I got the opportunity. So thankful for it. I feel like everything that I was teaching as a receivers coach were things that I had to learn from somebody else because I didn't play the position. Right. And everything that I'm teaching quarterbacks. A lot of it is learned, but a lot of it is from experiences, the mistakes that I've made. Hey, this is why I struggle with this route concept. I used to do this. I see you doing the same thing. So it's a little bit coming from a different perspective. And um, I, so I think anytime you're you're coaching the position you played, I think you, you have a little bit more credibility. Um, I mean, I worked really hard to learn and master everything I could as a receivers coach. But at the end of the day, um, I, I think you, you're just going to get a little bit more a buy-in from your players when it's a position that you played. Right. What are some of the things that, I mean, you, we talked about Coach Bentley to begin with. I mean, Burns was always good, but when you were there, I mean, Burns went to a whole nother level. And so for the high school guys listening, and, you know, what were some of the things that you as a player, when it really, you know, went to a whole nother level, what were some of the things that he was doing that sort of maybe set him apart and set y'all apart as a program, of course, besides having good players, but you know, you've got to be able to run a program. Right. So I think some of the things that made burn special back then, a lot of programs are caught up and I don't, I think that's why there's maybe not quite so much of a, a gap between, um, you know, obviously the, the powers have shifted a little bit in high school football since then. And I, they probably kind of always will kind of every five or six, seven years, whatever, there'll be a, there'll be a new power kind of at the top. But I think the things that made burn special back then was, I don't know how many programs in the state of South Carolina had a full-time strength coach. We had a full-time strength coach, Mike Schrock, who's one of any strength coach in the state of South Carolina. I don't think you'll ever find anybody who'll say anything negatively about that man, because it's, he has high school coaches, college coaches, come and, and meet with them, study with them. He'll go there. Like he's the most, like the ultimate um, in this business for others, for other players and other coaches. Like you can't find a better, better example than that. But I think coach Bentley was one of the first to kind of get that going. And we were one of the first programs to have our own football only weightlifting PE three class at the end of the day, right. which is not as unique. Now, a lot of people are doing that. I think offensively uh, when coach Bentley implemented the spread, um, at Burns, when he started, I think, you know, there, there weren't as many teams running the spread offense. Now everybody's running the spread. So I think that's um, that's not quite as unique. But at that time, that system, and it was an air raid, uh, Tony Franklin type system, uh, was kind of ahead of the curve. But bigger than that, though, the, the things that I'm thankful to be a part of that program was how Coach Bentley 
and all of our coaches at Burns made it so much more than just just football. Now, Coach Bentley is one of the most competitive, extremely intense people you'll you'll ever be around. But like on Friday on game days at 3.30 or maybe it's 3.45, whatever, it was like 15 minutes after the bell rang, we had circle meetings. And circle meetings was something that he learned from um, – University of Tennessee basketball, women's basketball, what they used to do is they would have these circle meetings where a senior would get up and kind of talk to the team about what makes them tick, you know, what, 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 what motivates them, what hardships, you know, just kind of open your heart out to your, your team. And you learn things about your teammates that you maybe you didn't necessarily knew, or maybe you did do not the whole, whole team didn't know. And and so he was always geared towards trying to build a program and build a team that truly loved and cared about each other. And those things stick with me today. And it's the way that, that Coach Sweeney runs his programs, the same way that Coach Chowell runs his program. So, you know, those guys are different. Uh, Dabo Sweeney is different from Bobby Bentley. Bobby Bentley is different from Jamie Chowell. But the concept of trying to build a program and build a team that is not just geared, is not just focused on the football aspect, but trying to build a a family type atmosphere within that locker room and players truly love and care about each other. That's what makes all three of those guys in, in, in my eyes, all three of those guys are successful. That's what's made those guys successful. Um, so uh, I, I think those are kind of, that's the, the main thing. The weight room stuff is important. The, the office room was important, but the biggest thing was, was that we, we freaking, we loved each other. We run through a brick wall for each other and just saw one of my high school teammates the other day. And, and, and it's just a special, unique bond. Uh, with that group of guys. I mean, it seems like, I mean, you were blessed to have gotten to sort of work with all those guys that's, you know, probably helped you get to a certain point that a lot, I mean, there aren't a lot of guys your age that have gotten to the point that you've gotten to. Mm-hmm. And I mean, so I would think that that's definitely, you know, having those people starting all the way in high school. I mean, a lot of people don't have somebody like Coach Bentley at a program like Burns that's sort of doing those kinds of things at that early of an age that gets to, uh, you know, that allows a player like you to be exposed to that and um, sort of build that up for you as a coach going forward. I mean, that's a good deal. Um, So for you in high school, when you were sitting there before a game on Friday night at Burns, did you feel a lot of pressure? Um, it's something interesting to me because at times I sort of did in my sort of small town way, were you a kid that felt pressure or was just like, you know, just kind of rolled off your back or what, how was it for you during that time? I I had teammates that, that would, that would get really, you know, um, I guess just, you know, nervous about making a mistake or, you know, uh, what if I mess up? And, you know, one of the things that, I think my dad always did a really good job with us is building the, the mental side of you. And it, it, obviously you're training the physical side all the time. But I remember for a birthday, it might've been my junior year of high school or sophomore year of high school. He got me this book. It was called uh, mind gym and it's written by a sports psychologist and just an incredibly, incredibly impactful book. And I think with people like John Gordon and, Tim and Brian Kite, those guys that you see pop up on Twitter, I think building, you know, the mental aspect of your game is, is become a lot more, um, I guess, just common and more, you kind of see it more on social media and everything. But so for me, for the, the game days, the, the, the performance was the fun part, you know, that was the, I, I, I wanted, I wanted to be a big game. I wanted to be top 10 team versus top 10 team. I hope the whole, whole town's there. Let, like, let's go, let's go compete, man. This is what you, this is what you want. So to me, it was always, um, yeah, the game day, the performance side of it was, that was the exciting part. That's what I, I, I wanted that, you know? So, but everybody's different, you know, everybody's, everybody's sometimes, honestly, sometimes I, fi- I figured out about myself, my junior high school, you know, everybody has the, their songs that they listen to before a game. I got to the point where I was listening to like, I was getting too jacked up. Like usually like the first two or three passes of the game would be, 10 yards over the receiver's head, like no shot of completing it just because you're like too amped up. So I figured out, okay, I, I gotta like, I gotta be at like a seven or an eight. If I'm at a nine, <laughs> I stink. I'm not a good player. <laughs> so Willie, big games, man. Clemson running down the hill. You talked about that earlier. I always wanted to run down the hill. I did it at Clemson's football camp. 
but I never did <laughs> it. Not in quite a game. the same so there, buddy. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I did. There's like 20 people in the stadium. But what was that like the first time you rubbed the rock and ran down the hill at Clemson? Was that like a surreal moment? Was it as awesome as you thought it would be? Was it a letdown? What was that like? It, it's it's just kind of overrated. I'm just kidding. Really? Oh, <laughs> I, was, I was like, well, no. I wish you would have just said that so I could have felt better about my life. But whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. It's hey. it's, it's it's unreal. Like the view, the stadium. It, it's incredible because everything opens up and there's all this orange. So I, I, I got a little spoiled my first game, first uh, career game there. We are playing against Florida State on a Monday night. It was like, you know, ESPN's first first game of the year and everything. And I don't know how I did it. But, you know, most freshmen, they weren't going to let you get on that first bus. You know, they're going to – unless you're like, you know, if you're C.J. Spiller, you can probably get on that first bus that wraps around and come out of the hill. But there, I had no business being on that first bus, so I guess I was good at sneaking around. So I got on the first bus somehow, and then, you know, you get out of the bus – and you walk underneath of the scoreboard, and I was, I was, I got to the front somehow, some way. I squeezed through some guys. So, so if you're at the front, like the view is, is, it's insane. Like it's, and especially with the night game is against Florida State, Bowden Bowl. It was an unbelievable experience. Now there is, there is, you have to be careful about going down the hill. And maybe you guys have already talked about some people before, but you know it goes down and then it flattens out and then it goes down yeah. again. It drops off. So if you're going to be one of the jumpers, you have to really be careful with that jump because there, I don't know what year it was. I think it was before I got there, but a guy broke his leg because uh, he jumped at the top of the hill and then he landed when it was flat and he thought it was not going to be flat. Um, but the, the, the best picture I, I have is, so me and, and my, my roommate, Landon Walker, who at the time when he had finished his career, he had the most starts as an off, offensive lineman um, at, in a career at Clemson, we were, we kind of, we enjoyed watching professional wrestling. And so our favorite wrestling yes, stable is, was D generation X still is still the greatest. Uh, serious dude. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> what y'all did to Goldberg is inexcusable, man. That's <laughs> uh, so whatever. That's fine. So, so we, so we wanted to try and get a picture where we were spitting out water and like throwing up whichever version of DX you want to throw up as we were jumping. So we, we told a couple of people that we knew were going to be taking pictures and I'm surprised Landon wanted to join in with it because Landon was a starter. He's starting, you know, and, and he's got a, he's got a big responsibility. I was just a backup. So, you know, getting a good picture on the Hill was, was probably higher on my list of priorities that <laughs> night than it was for Landon. But, but when we left the locker room, when we left the locker room, we took a big gulp of, well, we didn't drink it. We just had it in our mouth because we knew we wouldn't get water all the way around. So from the time we walked out of the locker room, we had water in our mouth. We got on the bus, went all the way around the stadium, walked through the scoreboard, and timed it up perfect. And it was just r random luck that Roy Philpot, who used to work for one of the Clemson Tiger sites, um, snapped the picture. And it's like we're in the middle of the frame. We're spitting out our water, and we're throwing DX up. And it's, <laughs> it's like my, my crown jewel picture from my time at Clemson. Dude, I would have definitely at some point done something to go viral on that hill, though. Like, I guess if yes, that would have happened, if that would have happened now, yeah, because, I mean, I, my life for a long time was like, like let me make it as awkward as possible. And so, I mean, I would have, like, but you have, you don't want to hurt anybody. I would have just, like, barrel rolled the entire way down or, like, fell down, like, 30 times. I mean, <laughs> to be famous, I mean, you got to gotta do what, you get, what it takes. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to ask you this, too. Who is the most impressive athlete that you ever played with or against? Like Clemson. CJ Spiller. Okay. Yeah. Cl Cliff has told me Cliff was at South Carolina and played against CJ. What was he like on the football field? How would you describe him? So he and Jacoby Ford, if you guys remember Joe, Jacoby Ford. Oh, yeah. Remember, Clemson fans will definitely remember that name. Um, who's a receiver. They both ran on the track and field team as well. And Jacoby would have faster times when they would run at the different ACC meets and everything like that. CJ, but but I don't know, you know, there's no uh, stopwatch on the field, but CJ was just a completely different speed, just how explosive he was and how smooth he was. And he had just an unbelievable senior year, had an unbelievable career. But his senior year, I mean, that, that joker was just, he's just unbelievable. And our quarterback coach, his name's Billy Napier who is our, he, he, really? um, 
a head coach at University of uh, Louisiana Lafayette. So we played play against him. So that was cool getting the opportunity to see him before a game this past year. But I remember like so often in our position meetings, he'd be like, listen, listen fellas, listen. <laughs> if you if you want to throw completion, throw for a bunch of yards in this league, here's what you got to do. You got to check that sucker down to Spiller and let him go to work for you. <laughs> he, I, he would say that all the time. Just check it down to Spiller. <laughs> let him go. So, like, game plan, let CJ run sideways and throw him the ball and you're good to go? Throw it to CJ. Throw it to CJ. No, I just – no, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't like, try to – create a mentality of always check it down but he was like if it's not there dude get it to 28 you know because yeah, he's gonna he was he's unbelievable unbelievable player what would you say to guys that think that the ultimate goal of life is to go d1 to a big time d1 school like what do you think that mental about that mentality because there's a lot of high school guys like that i coach and i'm sure chad coaches that are like man about worse if Every I don't go D1, it ain't worth playing. What would your – because you went D1 and you played at Division Two. Like, what would you say to that? Like, what is the – what is well, your I takeaway? I don't think there's anything wrong with having having a goal of playing yeah. at the highest level. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're coaching, right? You want to you wanna continue to grow and, and coach at the highest level too, right? I mean, based if, you know, depending on what your priorities are. For me, it's, yeah, you'd love to coach at, at the highest level, but, but really at the end of the day, I think once you coach for – not very long you realize it's so much more about being at the right fit and yeah. and being a part of a culture and a program that you believe in and a place for me it's always going to come down to you know no matter what in this industry with what we do you're going to work a bunch of hours and there's, there's no way around it um but you know i always i want to work for a guy that that understands the balance and loves his family because i don't have any kids yet but i'm sure we'll get even It'll get even worse when I have kids. Like I want to, I want to be able to achieve balance as best as I can. You know, certain time of years when you, you're not going to be able to. But um, so, I am completely brainlocking on why I started talking about that. What was the original question? Is that is that even related? <laughs> I asked you. Holy crap! What did I ask? Hey, well, <laughs> you asked them um, uh, about no, I, the attitude of going D, having to go D one okay. or uh, yeah, they, that, sorry. Now we're on your future kids and balance of time. But, yeah, no, about D1 guys that want to go. tied all together. Should we just skip the question? Am I, no, am no, I fired? Good. We're good. No, so, so, so yeah, I, I got I got it. I always wanted to play at Clemson. That's where I wanted to play at when I was at fourth grade. When I started going to games in fourth grade, that is where I wanted to be. And and I, I think it was good to have that goal because you, it made you put in the time in maybe when other guys didn't want to put the time in. And you knew that you were going to – not partake on certain things on the weekends because it didn't align with your goal. So as far as having that goal of, of playing at the highest level, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I think there does come a point in time when at a certain point, maybe in the recruiting process, you realize, okay, these guys uh, aren't necessarily recruiting me, but this school is, this the smaller school is. Like to me, it's it's so much, more, probably more so because of my experience. It's so much about where your fit is. Like those two years at North Greenville, like I didn't grow up. Johnny, you didn't either. You didn't grow up thinking, you know what? I want to play college football in Tigerville. Hey, man. You're not, you're not thinking that. And that's, and that's okay. Yeah. And I think coaches understand that, too, to a certain extent. But then it, there comes a time when you got to be realistic with yourself and realize that just the opportunity to play college football in North Greenville, there's so many guys that would give that opportunity, that would give anything to play at that level. You know, so – um, I think if you get the opportunity to play college football, you're in such a small percentage of the population. You need to be thankful for it. And here's the thing. It's all about the, the problem with social media is it's always, you're always comparing yourself. Comparison is the thief, thief of joy. I'm always, you know, these kids are, are comparing themselves to the, the guy at this school who's gotten bigger offers or more accolades. And you can't do that, you know, be, you know, uh, appreciative of what you have, appreciative of the opportunities that you get. And and maybe I wouldn't have said that when my freshman year at Clemson, but because of my experience, I went from playing at Clemson to playing Division II football. Man, I love my experience there. I love my teammates there. So, yeah, I, I, I think the comparison piece is a big contributor to that now. Yeah. Do you see that from your side of it in college, which, I mean, you are at the D1 level, but, you know, 
are you seeing that more and more would you, when you maybe when you were at Charleston Southern? I mean, to me, I feel like as a high school coach, every year with Twitter and stuff, I feel like it gets worse. That mindset of of kids, you see that from the college side, or are you just kind of insulated from it? I feel like I don't see it as much now that you know you're coaching at the Sun Belt level, but at Charleston Southern, all the time. Oh yeah, all yeah. the time. You know this. Uh, you, you know, no one will come out and say it. Hey, I'm 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 bigger than you. I won't play there, but it's you, you, you can read between the lines, and there's not a whole lot of interest on the other part. So I think part of what why we had some success there, and we're adopting the same mentality here from a recruiting standpoint at Coastal Carolina. If you don't want to be here, we're not going to chase and beg you. We're going to recruit you and try to get you here on campus. But if if you feel like you're above this place, if you feel like you need to be at uh, a bigger stadium or a bigger weight room or whatever. Hey, that's okay. Let, let's go our, our separate ways. Because if we get guys here who truly love and are passionate about Coastal Carolina, truly love and care about their teammates, we'll beat teams that have better, more talent than us on paper. I truly, truly believe that because I've seen it. That's what happened at North Greenville. You had a bunch of guys that wanted to be at North Greenville, and we, were, and we had success. We had a bunch of guys at Charleston Southern that wanted to be at Charleston Southern when a lot of people didn't want to be at Charleston Southern had success. So I know this. I know the same thing will happen here. We just got to um, get the current players believing that, buying into that. And we had official visits in June uh, from prospective high school uh, players coming to visit, and and we get feedback from our players. So the guys that host them, hey, did, would you like to have that guy as your teammate? Would you want him in your locker room? I know that doesn't apply to high school coaches, but – uh, to whatever way you want to mold it and shape it into a uh, high school format. That's how we use it from a recruiting standpoint that, man, if you think you're above this place, if there's any sense of entitlement, no, thanks. We'll pass. You know, we'll take maybe the lesser talented guy, but he'll overachieve. He'll outwork the other guy and ultimately be a better teammate and better fit. I really feel like, I, I don't say I feel like, I know y'all are going to get it. Good man, because it ain't a hard sell to come play football down here at the beach. Like that's a <laughs> hey, you you want to go to Nebraska in a cornfield, or you want to come to Myrtle Beach and play football so, and freaking live down here? I mean, it's let me tell this story. So I got um offered by New Hampshire and University of New Hampshire my, after my senior year and everything. Coastal hadn't offered me yet. Basically, a couple days after New Hampshire offered me, Coastal offered me. They came in after the fact. But I'd already set up my official to New Hampshire. So I went up on my official visit and all my hosts and stuff like the first question I asked, you know, what are the offers you have? Well, really the only other place I'm considering is Coastal. Immediately, every single one of them was like, oh, well, we ain't getting you then. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. They were like, why would you come here and not go to the beach? And I, of course, I ended up going there. But why would you come here instead of going to freaking Myrtle Beach to play football? Like, <laughs> that's a pretty good deal. So, I mean, it's, it's, y'all got some stuff going for you without a doubt. You, you just got to make sure that there are so many positives of coming to school here. There's a lot of things to do. You got to make sure uh, on our part, we're getting the guys that want to be here for the right reasons, not just because of the location. Location can be the cherry on top, but don't just come to Coastal because you're at the beach. I think that's what you got to fight against there um, yeah. to make sure you're building your culture the right way that you want it. You want to build it. If that's the only reason, then – yeah, you might turn into beach guy one day that just is like lived here for 40 years and has a lot of weird. Never wear shoes. That's, he's wearing jorts and a tie dye color. Leather skin. Where they came from? Yeah. Uh, Willie, closing it right here. We wanna. I wanna ask you something. One of the things me and Chad really like to do is talk about the co the coaches subculture and like the weird things that we do. And I heard you earlier saying that sometimes coaches are serious and that can be funny. Uh, we do something on here called the coaches cliche. So we have a segment. Players and coaches, and a couple of them that we've talked about so far are: if you don't want to be here, leave. If you don't want to go hard, we'll run all practice. And the first one we talked about, Chad, what was the first one we talked about? You don't want to be pretty. here. Leave. Looking oh, pretty. Why you want to look pretty? Is there anything throughout your time as a player or coach that you've just heard over and over again that's become a cliche to you that's kind of comical? Whew. Um, we have things that we all say. I mean. I know yeah, that you I use them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here, but do you have anything, or do you have like a serious coach from the past that was like a funny guy and acted like he could never laugh because he was such a manly ball coach? Oh man, <laughs> man, I'm trying to. I wish I had something better off the top of my head. 
you know, if you, maybe if you hadn't asked it directly, I'd be able to pop them off because they are. They're just on the tip of your tongue. Yeah, there's, there's almost too many of them. Well, yeah. one of the things me and Chad are going to talk about, too, is how coaches act like they can't know what a tech – like Bill Belichick. Face. Like, you know what Facebook is, man. Like, you don't have to call it Snap Face because you're a football coach that acts like he doesn't know anything about the world except for football. Like, have you ever had anybody like that that's just like, I'm a football coach and I don't – if you want to talk about anything besides football, then you're soft. <laughs> I know um, you know. I, I, I've been so lucky to be around guys that are like. Not, not that like way, that. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm just thinking about from a coaching standpoint, I've been around a, a group of guys that I've, you've really enjoyed being around and working with, you know? Yeah. So, and I don't, I, don't, I don't think we've had very many of those. Yeah, I, I remember when I was in when I was in college. I remember my second year when I was at Clemson. I can't remember, but there was an ACC coach that you know when we were in school. I don't know if Call of Duty is still at the top of everybody's list, but Call of Duty hopping on and playing online with your buddies like yeah. those are some good nights. Like those were awesome nights, you know, playing Call of Duty with your guys. I do remember though that there was one uh, posing like ACC coach that said something like. Call of Duty is going to be the death of college football. All these kids are spending all their time playing Call of Duty, and they should be working out. They should be studying the playbook. And so I guess now it's more um, – what's the, the game now? Um, Fortnite was big for Fortnite. Long. Fortnite. Mine, Fortnite's still Minecraft in? Is, Minecraft is getting pretty big now, too, though. Minecraft? Oh, my God. I don't really know what that is. But Fortnite. If, if no kids are going to be playing is. Minecraft, then we're, we're not going to be as good as we could <laughs> yeah. be. We, no kid will ever make a tackle again because he played Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> if you aren't focusing on football and getting mental reps every moment of your life, you will suck. Like, I think Madden might be okay, but if you're playing Madden and you play offensive line, you better be watching the right tackles fundamentals. You better not be looking at who you're throwing the ball to. And, and you better upload our playbook with our terminology. Yeah. <laughs> you better be studying it. If anybody else gets it, though, you're in trouble, boy. Have you heard the uh, study that the – to average human uh, attention span is that of a goldfish now. Have you heard that study? What, are you serious? Oh, my gosh. That's, it doesn't that's, surprise me at all. But. Yeah, that's that's what I read. Jeez. It does, I, I can't find really, a source. I don't know what academic journal that came from, but I <laughs> I heard it. Who would you hear it from? This, uh, I just heard it. I don't know. Who but, conducted the study on the goldfish to see how long <laughs> they could pay attention? And who qualified he is no longer paying attention. So we'll, <laughs> we'll take that with a grain of salt, Willie, but I appreciate you coming on, man. It's been fun. I, I enjoyed hearing your perspective. And I mean, I know you as a friend and a, and a teammate, but um, I think there's a lot to gain from your experience and what you've gone through. And honestly, I know you probably don't want me to say this, but you are just one of the most genuinely kind guys I've ever been around. And um well, I just enjoyed playing with you. You were the most, humble, most humble. I'm just saying. Dude. Uh, you're one of the hey, most don't humble. listen to them. Keep going, John. Please, you're, keep going. It's kind of cute. No, he's one of the most humble guys. Uh, and, man, it was a black worth green. You know, when you have a guy from Clemson coming in, it's kind of like, all right, what's this guy going to be like? But you never acted like you were better than anybody. We just had fun and um, enjoyed it. And you know, it, it, it was just an enjoyable experience. And just even after coaching, man, I saw you at the Night to Shine event where the uh, they have the prom for the kids with special needs. And we had a great time there that, in Conway in February, just dancing and hanging out. So um, not only are you good, you, dude, I was you dancing in there. I was really proud of you. I was dancing in there. And then you like came in like, somebody was like right on my back. And I was like, who is this? I turned around and it was you. And I was like, let's get it, hey. dude. But um, <laughs> yeah, man, not all, like you said, it's not just about football. I think ultimately if you're a coach, you just need to be a good person. Like if you're not a good person, Kids can pick up on that, and if yeah. you don't care about them, I know it's said all the time, but if you don't care about them outside of football, then they know that, you know. So um, I know that you do that, and thank you for joining us, man. I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Looking forward to the episodes in the future. Like I said, if you guys have these things pumping out in May during recruiting, I bet you get a bunch of college coaches listening because there's nothing but going into the high school and then driving around for 15, 20 minutes <laughs> to the next school. So you'll get a bunch of listeners in May. So. Excited for you guys. Thanks for having me on. Good stuff from Willie right there, Chad. I really love his perspective on coaching. And um, he just is, I mean, he was always a fun guy playing with him at North Greenville. And I know he has a good time with his guys, but he's really learned a lot from his experiences. And I think that everybody can definitely learn from what he went through. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, his journey is 
so cool. Um, I mean, obviously, I remember remember hearing about him and even watching him on ESPN when I was in middle school and all that and his story to get to the point where you played with him and me having a chance to meet him, obviously, and talk to him and being sort of in the same profession, even though him obviously being in college. But, um, you know, he's obviously a really, really cool guy. And he's used, um, you know, his unique journey to make him a really successful coach, especially for his age and, um, you know, to really advance his career and get pretty far. Dad, if you had Willie, would you win state? Yes. It'd be, if you've got good players, if if you've got a player like that, you're going to be in pretty good shape. At the age that he's at right now. No, I'm not talking about Willie in high school. I'm talking about Willie. Oh, you're talking about right now. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, um, I don't, I mean, he's he's a receivers coach, right? Yeah. So he throws every day. Quarterback now. Either way. Yeah, same thing. He still throws every day. Yeah. Yeah. He'd be a baller. Speaking of that, Chad, I want to talk to you about what matters right now um, with coach. You hear coaches say it all the time, and it's pretty much like a cliche like we've been doing at at the end of every episode. Jimmy's and Joe's or X's and O's, what do you think makes more of a difference? You've got the coaches that think that their system is going to win them the state championship, and then you've got the coaches that say it doesn't matter what the heck you do. You can never lift a weight as long as you've got the right players. What's your thoughts on that? So, I mean, I think that this topic is one of the things that is so different from how people on the outside of the profession view it, as opposed to people who actually coach view it. Um, and I mean, we, we, we've talked about it and brought it up going all the way back to coach Richardson's, um, podcast, the very first thing with him at Northwestern with Cordero L Patterson and Mason Rudolph and all those guys. But I think that people on the outside don't realize how much players matter. Like, just your random fans sitting in the stands, I don't think they realize how much it matters. One thing that I've sort of said that I learned after, um, you know, getting into coaching that I didn't really know when I was a player, I do believe that to win a state championship with anybody at basically any level of high school or college football, and obviously the NFL, you have to be a good coach. Like, there's basically no way to be an incompetent coach and win state, regardless of if you have Northwestern's guys when they were awesome or Burns guys when Willie played for them, you have to be a good coach on some level to ever be that successful. But I also think that there are a lot of coaches that are that good and, and would have the same success as people have had at you know programs where there's a lot of good athletes or whatever, but they never win because they're never at that place. So I think that like, you know, coaching sort of gets you to a certain level but then from that point on, it's about how good your players are. Yeah. You have to have a minimum threshold of talent to have a, any chance at all to win a state championship. If you, you cannot win a state championship without some good players. Yeah, it's impossible. Because yeah. eventually you're going to run into – you could be in a classification or in a state where coaching isn't necessarily at a high level like it is at – Certain places, like, I mean, I think probably South Carolina is one of the places that spends a lot of time on coaching and a lot of money on coaching. But you can be in a state or classification where there's not a, maybe not the best coach in the world, but at some point you're going to run into a program that has good athletes and is competently coached. And if, if even if you're a good coach, if you don't have the athletes to match that, you just, there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, what, I mean, there's nothing you can do. Would you rather be a coach that wins state? <laughs> every year with your team looking like they are horribly coached and they have no idea what they're doing? Or would you be rather be like the master coach team that everybody knows that team gets every single ounce out of their players? Like their players are terrible and they go to state every year and you win one state championship in your career. I do win one. Yes. I mean, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, that, that's kind of a weird vacuum argument because it's like, would you rather win and have everybody in the world think you're an idiot? Which, let, let's say your offensive line literally just, like, falls on the ground every play, and you have the best <laughs> – Adrian Peterson is your running back, <laughs> and he just runs touchdowns. Like, that is that gratifying? Well, for I mean, I can tell you what I would choose, but, like, it's probably different than a lot of people. Like, I'm about winning, man. Like, I just want to win. So – like, I'm the kind of guy, like, if I'm playing pickup basketball, like, if there's other people on the team that are way better than me, I want them to shoot every single time. I don't ever need to touch the ball. Go shoot so we can win. 
So, yeah, I mean, I don't care if we look – I just want to win. If we're winning and everybody has to think I'm an idiot for us to win, I'm in. Sign me up. Like, I mean, I'm kind of in a situation – I mean, we're not – obviously, we're not a million times better than everybody we play, but I'm in a situation now where I'm in an average game on a normal Friday night, I'm probably going to be more talented than the other team. Um, and that doesn't hurt my feelings a bit. Yeah, and it shouldn't. I mean, it shouldn't. You – you got to coach your guys that you have, and um, you're in a place right now where you're fortunate enough to have guys that if they play well, you're going to win a state championship or have a really good chance to win have a state a, Have a chance. There you go. Shut up. No, uh, that, no okay. it, that's not the case Like, because we're talking about other people. Like, There are other people with good players. Like, That's exactly what we're talking about. Correct. Like, At some point, like, I'm going to have to coach well for us to beat a team that's got other good players if we're going to do that, and the players obviously have to play well. Right. I mean, what is it for you? I mean, what's like, what would you choose in that? Would you rather just be like, I mean, we can, I mean, I, I know programs, like I'm thinking of people in my head of like coaches who coach at programs that like haven't won a state championship and probably never will at that program that are as good a coach as I know. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's different for me because I'm, <laughs> I'm the opposite line coach. I'm not the head coach. Right I'm now. saying, but if you're a head coach, like what would you rather? Do you rather a well-oiled machine that doesn't have the athletes, you're just going to lose in the second round just because you're going to. Or would you rather just be like, man, they have no discipline or anything, but they go win? Are my players actually idiots, though? Like, are they actually just like no discipline, get in trouble all the time? No, like, no. Well, I say discipline on the field. I ain't talking about getting in trouble all the time. That's a different kind of discipline. I'm talking about on the field. Like, you get freaking 15 yard, um, uns- not unsportsmanlike, but procedure penalties and everything like that. Like, you just 10 men on the field half the time, and but your so players like, are so good it doesn't matter. I'm like coaching the offensive line, and they like all suck, and they're terrible. Oh, yeah, they just, I mean, they get destroyed. You got guards pulling and running into each other, and you can't get 11 men on the kickoff. But once you do kick it, it's going in the end zone. That sounds like a terrible nightmare. That's, why, why would I But you're winning. Like, but you're winning. I'm not, but I'm, I have no part of that. It does. You're going to get a ring at the end of the year, and your I name goes. Did nothing. I did nothing to deserve that. I'm coaching the O-line, and they're pulling into each other. Okay, how's that different? Okay, let's in North Myrtle Beach, your high school. Y'all yes. win a state championship this year. Does Y'all are going to have a kid that probably won't play a snap in the playoffs, I'm sure. Does that kid, should, shouldn't he be able to feel ownership of the state championship if you win, even though he really didn't? He contributed in practice. But did yeah. he? If a but, kid didn't, if but a kid did didn't, he contribute in practice? If a or kid, was he a human that stood there and probably didn't give y'all near the look that you would have rather had? <laughs> if there is a human <laughs> that does not practice at all for us, that sits there purposely being lazy, just getting a sandwich on game day, then they probably shouldn't feel too much pride in that state championship. Wow. Well, well, don't give okay. me that. No, 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 I'm you not. You would say the same <laughs> Give thing. me, okay, I'm going to paint you the exact situation. You've got an offensive lineman, okay? Yeah. He never plays in a, like, he's not going to play any in the playoffs. Yeah. He's 5'5", five, five, 140 pounds, but he plays offensive line because he can't do anything else. Like, let's, let's, yeah. let's run little Johnny down with Coach White because we don't want to watch him not catch football. So, they run little Johnny down there. The only thing he ever does is to maybe do scout team. Every time he goes out on scout team, he gets blown up every single play. Y'all have no ability to run scout team offense because he's getting destroyed, but he is giving everything that his 5'5", 140-pound unathletic body will give to the team. But really, he's not But he's not doing anything to actually help the team on in the game. He should definitely feel something then. He's, Why? Because he's giving all of his effort to do that. Okay, but if you're a coach and you're giving all of your effort and you're, you just your kids are just – refuse to have discipline on the field then you should still feel ownership correct but okay so if i was that like if i if that was me i would realize i am a terrible coach and i don't need to be coaching if i cannot get guys to do anything i tell them to do yeah but that this is what a hypothetical is man like i get that's what it is in real life hypothetically are you choosing what i chose are you choosing i'll win Regardless of what, if everybody in the world thinks I'm an idiot or I will lose and everybody say, man, they're well coached. Them little Johnnies out there, they line up where they're supposed to line up. Nah, I mean, I'm going to win because at the end of the day, if you win the championship, you win the state championship. That's it. But 
in reality, I would not have any enjoyment in that at all. I would be like, I saw it. Yeah, I mean, in in reality, if you actually can't get 11 men on the kickoff, then yes, there's clearly a problem with you. And in reality, you're not going to win a state championship. Can we talk about the kid that you just described, though? Because that's real. Like, the kid who is a small wide receiver that can't catch or run, that ends up playing offensive they line. Throw him like, down on the offensive how, or defensive line. How does that happen? He is too small to be a wide receiver. He can't catch, and he's slow. Let's put him at guard. How, why? You're the head coach. Tell me why that happens. Uh, because you don't, you don't annoy the athletic guys. That no, are, that's not what it is. You, if you're on the closer you are to the ball, the less you get noticed. So you just as a like that's just the way the world works. So you stick them on down in there. That way, if like he actually does have to go in the game or something, like you know, in a blowout or whatever. You put him in at guard, he's going to get killed, but nobody's really even going to know he gets killed because nobody's watching the guard anyway. If you put him out at receiver and you try to throw it to him in front of everybody, and obviously it's going to go like it's going to go with little Johnny, then everybody's going to see that. So you just, just stick him on down with a lineman, and they're all like, they'll joke with him, and that is know, they'll have fun with him, and all yeah. that stuff. Or is he, if he stays with the Divas, like, you know, they're going to get some like legit digs in him. It is a better fit for his life to be with the linemen because the yeah. linemen are going to take him as one of their own, and they're going to be like, they're probably going to give him a nickname. He's probably going to like smile really big when they do it, and they're going to love him because they all know that they aren't really getting the glory either. <coughs> take him on as one of their own. Maybe one time in a board drill, he'll like kind of halfway knock a guy like one tenth of an inch back, and everybody loses their mind. Um, so yeah, I get that. So we had a kid, we just brought up all of our B team kids because their season's over. Um, I mean, and, and we're 1A, so there's it's like eight or nine of them. And um, one of the kids is like legitimately 5'3". Like he might be the shortest kid I've ever seen on a high school football field. But like he actually started for the B team. And we're, no, he might not have started, but he played a good bit. And he is like the toughest kid ever. He breaks his thumb on the first day of practice. Like, their first drill. He's going through indie drills at DB. He falls, and, like, his thumb jams it to the ground and breaks it. It's completely sideways. And he just, like, gets up laughing and going and showing all our other diva DBs. And they're, like, grossed out, out by it. And he's just, like, laughing. I love that kid. Trying to gross them out. And then he I just, like, went over and, like, he went to the doctor, got it all casted up. And he was back in practice today with a club at DB at 5'3", 110 pounds. Not really going to play, but giving us all tough as nails. The guys like, that have that kids. mentality that actually have the body and the speed and all that stuff, those are the kids that go to Alabama. Oh, yeah, that's so, right. That's God. right. Yeah, I, the kids like that. And the other thing, what made me think of that, you talking about nicknames. All nine kids that we brought up all already have a nickname. Like, yeah, all of them have a nickname. Just like it was like as they were walking out onto the practice field, it was like, you're this, you're this, you're this. Just like immediately, y'all have a nickname now. This is what you're going to go by for your next four years. It's so weird how that happens. But it's good for kids. It's good for it the is. camaraderie. Bond. Brings them in the family. Yeah. Well, guys, we're here in the playoffs in South Carolina right now. We're playing the number one team in the state, Myrtle Beach, for the second time this Ooh. year, Friday. It's going to be cold. It's going to be maybe rainy. So we'll see, Chad. You got your first playoff game this week, too, right? Yep, we had a first round bye. We are at home against Ware Shoals. Um, yeah, first playoff game of the year. Hopefully it'll it'll go well. Are they pretty good? <laughs> if we play like we're capable of playing, I think we got a good chance. I got you. <laughs> I hate you. All right, guys. Um, Don't edit this out. Remember, <laughs> on Twitter, you can find us at Coaches Drive. Our email is the Oh, you Drive are the worst. Gmail.com. Subscribe, rate, and review us. Chad, it was fun. <laughs> Till next time, y'all. See ya.